I like to call this an intermezzo in the novel. Suddenly, there's tremendous warmth and mutual understanding. Here, these people are out on the field of the hunt. We see many members of the Rastoff family, including the old count himself, in their riding costumes and on horseback, a position as ordinary for them as it would be for us to sit in an automobile. We also see, in a certain sense, there's an analogy being made between the field of the hunt and the field of battle. Nikolai is bound and determined to catch that wolf. Suddenly, nothing seems so important to him as catching that wolf. Lo and behold, when we finally catch sight of the hunted animal, believe it or not, the animal actually talks good Russian. You wouldn't believe this, but the first several times I read this book, I actually believed that the wolf was talking. So you say to me, now, hold on, wait a minute. Wolves don't talk. They don't talk English, they don't talk Russian, or any human language that we'd recognize. What is this? Tolstoy actually animates the wolf to a point where he has a character entirely equivalent to any of the characters in the story, any of the human characters. There are not two wolves, two foxes, two rabbits, or two horses that have the same character in this novel any more than the two human beings that have the same character. Tolstoy, as I said before, is a wizard and manages to make this world come to life. There's something godlike in what Tolstoy does. He's creating a universe, in a certain sense, this way, the way that God creates the universe in the Bible. And in that sense, Tolstoy is almost comparable to some kind of God. This scene is a remarkable scene. And all the more remarkable, because the old Count Rastov is bungling his hunter's duties. Of course, he's had <laughs> a bit to drink and eat to fortify himself before he goes out. He goes out on the field, and he's supposed to watch for the fox, but he doesn't know how to watch for the fox, and so he bungles it. And the man who's a serf, Danilov, actually screams at the Count, giving it to him the way you would think the Count would give it to one of his own serfs. Obviously, in the context of the hunt, the whole social situation is reversed. Who's in charge of the whole situation? It's the serf. And of course, both of them are quite embarrassed at what happens at this turn of social relations. Meanwhile, Nikolai rides out on his side of the hunt and manages to run across some people against whom the Rostov family has a lawsuit. They're arguing about who's the owner of certain lands between, that lies between their two estates. To his amazement, to Nikolai's amazement, he's expecting to really give it to this fellow. You're really ready for Nikolai's well-known temper to explode again against the guy, and the man he meets turns out to be a very courteous gentleman. Nikolai immediately picks up the decency of this guy's feeling. And instead of the anger you expect to find, when you, find uh, you suddenly find two men who understand the decency of each other. Instead, of course, they talk about the dogs, and Nikolai is tremendously eager for his own dogs to do a better job than the dogs of his neighbor. At this time, he also meets a character called Uncle, who invites Nikolai and also Natasha, Nikolai's sister, who's insisted that she be allowed to come on the hunt, despite the fact they don't want a woman. But Natasha is strong enough, nobody can res resist Natasha. So she, too, is on the hunt, and she and Nikolai are invited by Uncle to visit his house, and you enter a genuine Russian house in the countryside. It's a house with a housekeeper, and of course one might have some questions about what the actual relations are between the, the so-called housekeeper and uncle who has no other woman in the house. The housekeeper gives him the most delicious food. You wouldn't believe how good it tastes as it does in the countryside right here. There's meat pies, liquors, and liqueur. There's absolutely everything to absolutely satisfy the palate, not to mention, of course, good solid Russian bread that bites back when you eat it. Oh, it's magnificent. Then the uncle takes hold of his guitar and starts to play Russian songs. When Natasha hears this, she suddenly jumps up, drapes her shawl around her, uh, her shoulders in the way of a traditional Russian dancer, and starts to dance in the Russian way. It's not the way she's been taught to dance by those French Western teachers, but like a true Russian girl. It's a very famous scene. Matter of fact, it's the basis of a book that's been recently published in this country called Natasha's Dance. Tolstoy says, Где? Как? Когда всосала в себя из того русского духа, которым она дышала, Это графинечка, воспитанная эмигранткой француженкой. Где она нашла этот дух? Where, how and when did she suck in this into herself? From that Russian soul by means of which she breathed, this little countess who was brought up an, um, by an emigre French teacher, where did Natasha get this spirit? She wasn't trained to it, she wasn't educated to it, and yet, this being Natasha, she exhibits the most beautiful part of the Russian spirit. Those movements with the pas de chale, the step of the shawl, should have been wiped out a long time ago. 
but the spirit and movements were exactly those inimitable, unstudied Russian ones which her dear uncle was expecting of her. The exact expression of feeling, once again, Tolstoy is arguing for human feeling coming deep from deeply inside the individual's soul, unlearned, inimitable, the basis of all genuine human relations. It occurs in this intermezzo, but it also applies to the entire novel, both in the scenes of war and of peace. One can almost say this is not a novel about war with a capital W and peace with a capital P, Vojna i Mir, but rather about the wars and pieces with small letters of the human soul. When you examine the genuine nature of the human soul, you realize there isn't that difference between war and peace that the overview of history tempts us to make. So the intermezzo ends with some beautiful scenes and were taken back to the maelstrom of war, attempting to catch the greatest movements and troops in Europe known at that time. Napoleon has put together from many different nationalities a huge army. These are not simply Frenchmen. By the way, some of the bravest of the soldiers were Poles who were fighting to get the independence of Poland from Russia, an independence which Napoleon had promised. These soldiers came from all the way across Europe and into the vast spaces of Russia. Here they were met by an equally large, or perhaps an even larger army, of Russians, most of them peasants. Russian soldiers were often called peasants in overcoats, trying to stem the thrust of the most famous military tactician at that time. So here we have Napoleon, Napoleon, brilliant, dashing, verbal, a man who knows how to stand before an army. Remember his remarks in Egypt, centuries looking down upon us, he says, the pyramids of Egypt see you. Remember Napoleon there, there. he knows exactly how to talk to his troops, to inspire Frenchmen to, be, uh, to, to achieve the valor of which a Frenchman is capable. On the other side, much to the disgust of many of the Russian aristocrats, and even perhaps of the Tsar himself, Marshal Kutuzov, heavy, half blind because he lost an eye in an earlier battle against the Turks, uh, clumsy on a horse, deeply skeptical of all brilliant military strategy, and determined to defeat the enemy by relying on the patience and the nature of the Russian fighting man. Why was it that the Tsar was forced, almost against his will, perhaps against his will, at least according to Tolstoy, to put Kutuzov at the head of the army, instead of one of those dashing, brilliant military strategists, whether a foreign general or one of the Russian aristocracy in the, the Tsar's own family? This was done clearly because they understood that Kutuzov knew the Russian soldier. He understood a good night's sleep is the most important preparation for battle. We have the generals talking about how they're planning a brilliant battle which is sure to defeat Napoleon. And it's done entirely either in French or in German. The erste colonne marchiert, the zweite colonne marchiert, the dritte colonne marchiert. The first column shoots here, the second column follows there, and the third column comes behind. Of course, they couldn't possibly predict where those columns were going to actually end up in the real battlefield covered with smoke. Nobody knows where he's going, particularly because of the smoke from the artillery. You can't see much further than your own arm under your own nose. It was impossible to predict, and yet these generals were doing brilliant military strategy, which they were sure would defeat the enemy. Of course, Napoleon himself was well known as an extraordinarily brilliant strategist. And what did Kutuzov do, the Russian commander? As I said before, when they talk about strategy in the night before the battle, he falls asleep, because a good night's sleep is what you really need before a battle. One of the most famous parts of the book is Tolstoy's description of the Battle of Bradino, which the French call La Bataille de Moscou, the Battle of Moscow. Bradino is a city not too far to the west of Moscow, where huge numbers of Russians were facing huge numbers of French. Remember, I told you before that in Stendhal's novel, The Charterhouse of Parma, he has his protagonist, Fabrizio del Dongo, on the field of battle, seeing the battle through the eyes of a drunk man. He had gotten pretty drunk when the battle had started. In short, you see the battle from the point of view of a man who knows nothing about military strategy. You'll see it through the eyes of a completely naive person who really doesn't understand what he's seeing. And according to Tolstoy, that's really the way to see a battle. You see a battle not the way you think it should be, but the way it really is. Pierre, at the Battle of Borodino, is dressed in civilian clothes with a big feather on top of his hat, which makes it even more dangerous, and of course he's totally ignorant. In this scene, Pierre Bizuchov is what Fabrizio del Dongo was for Stendhal at the Battle of Waterloo. We also see Andrei Balkonsky, who's going to be mortally wounded on the field of battle. He's going to get a wound which will cause his death in the, course of, in the later course of the novel. You understand 
that Balkonsky had been betrothed to Natasha, but he had left for a year, making Natasha suffer a great deal. In the course of that year, Anatoly Kuragin, one of the sons of Prince Vasily, and this uh, Anatoly was as close to a scoundrel as a Tolstoy ca character ever gets, uh, he has seen Natasha, he's been attracted to her, and he feels lust, so he proposes marriage to her. He proposes that she run away from her family and marry him. Of course, what he doesn't tell her is that he's already married. He's already married and can't marry her, but this will get her to run away and have physical relations with him. Luckily for Natasha, the family has alerted a cousin named Sonia to the fact that something strange is happening. When Anatoly comes into the house, Sonia notifies the people who are defending the house and they have to flee. But of course, Natasha is in total disgrace. It's when it becomes clear that she, a betrothed woman, has all of a sudden, without any warning, decided to run off with another man. When she learns the truth from Pierre, that Anatoly was actually already married, Natasha falls into a terrible sickness, which has a profound effect on her personality and plays a significant role in her maturation from a young girl into a mature person. When Balkonsky comes back, he doesn't blame the Natasha. He blames Anatoly, and then, of course, he calls off the marriage. He's determined that he will find with that Anatoly come what may. You don't do this to Andrei Balkonsky and get away with it lightly. And with all the resources of the Balkonsky family, one of the richest in Russia at that time, he looks for Anatoly high and low, east and west, north and south, and it's as if Anatoly's been swallowed up by the earth. Nobody can find him. Now, Andrei's been mortally wounded on the battlefield of Barajino. Tolstoy shows us a military hospital, and oh, it's terrible. A doctor with a bloody finger, holding a cigar with just the tips of his finger where there's no blood. And Andre is lying there in the dispensary, and next to him, an amputation is taking place. And we feel the saw as it goes back and forth over the human bone, and the character is crying in pain. He's, the, 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 he gives out a cry, ooh, ooh, and we hear that cry through the whole place. The doctor holds up the leg, which he's just amputated. It's just horrible. And we suddenly realize that that young man, whose leg has just been cut off, is Anatoly Kuragin. Now, how can a writer get away with a coincidence like this? If this were any other writer, the critics would be screaming that's an unbelievable coincidence. Yet Tolstoy makes it happen. It seems to me that he makes it happen because it deals with the deepest philosophy of the novel, namely that you cannot predict human behavior. Human behavior is so complicated in so many different variations that mere coincidence is more conv convincing than any ideology, any strategy, or any idea. You end up with Tolstoy's view of history. How does this novel actually end? This novel of war and peace that has huge armies going back and forth. Natasha later on is married. Uh, she's the mother of a child. She's married to Pierre Bizukhov, whose earlier unhappy marriage ended with the death of his, of his wife, and now he's the husband. And Natasha comes running in with a diaper in her hand, and cries, look, look, it's brown, it's no longer green, the child is no longer sick. And anybody who's changed diapers, of course, as I have many times, knows what this means. This magnificent novel ends with a pair of dirty diapers. <laughs> The armies, Napoleon, Kutuzov, the Russian aristocracy, the families, the Tsar, and it all ends up with a pair of dirty diapers. Only Tolstoy could pull off something like this. Only Tolstoy can make the, magnificent of every, the magnificence of everything I've just described end up with a pair of dirty diapers. <laughs>